everybody, welcome to In Production. I'm flying a bit solo today. <clears throat> Jeff is gone. I have the Shogun turned around, so if my eyes dart off, you know, I'm looking at myself. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, just kind of, kind of how the way we do it, right? Um, so how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. Uh, today's show is uh, I gotta get my polar polar bear's nuts. Um, I, today's show is uh, going to be kind of like a AMA you might find on Reddit or whatever. Uh, the difference being you can ask me almost anything. So I am going to quite literally make it a ask me almost anything. I will answer it. Uh, we're pretty honest on this channel anyway. And if it's something that I either can't answer due to restrictions or I can't answer because I don't want to, I will just say anything else um, and dodge around it. Uh, yeah, Jeff is out of town. He should probably pop up in the chat. I don't know where he is. He is traveling with his father to uh, play in the woods of Kentucky. They're going on their annual, semi-annual... <laughs> I don't know if Jeff's listening. <laughs> they're going on their semi-annual... They're going on their semi-annual uh, moonshine trip. I'm just kidding. Color of the underwear off the table. No, it is not. I am wearing gray. Gray underwear. Uh, not tidy whitey style. Boxer briefs. I like a little snug. I don't like total freedom. I feel like total freedom is too much for my guys. So a little snug. Got to keep them contained a little bit. I treat them like teenagers. That's how I treat them. You want to give them a little freedom, but you want to give them too much. If you give them too much, nah, they just run wild with the place. So a little bit of freedom, boxer briefs, that's what's preferred on today's episode of AMA. I'm also going to show you guys a uh, down and dirty, cheap light trick that I found. Uh, light leak thing. Uh, not that I found. I was just monkeying around. Uh, we were shooting something for a client, and I was just playing, <laughs> playing around. I was like, oh, that, that's actually kind of interesting. Uh, I haven't fully experimented. I think there's other ways you can, you can utilize it into your favor. Um, that makes it awesome. By the way, I'm not going to put the chats key up anymore. I don't know if you guys have noticed, YouTube now has the chats where you can actually follow along. It's like uh, Facebook now. So we don't have to do the chats key box anymore because your comments are being posted alongside the video as it plays back. So it's a del very delightful uh, scenario for those watching uh, in the future. Though it's the past, it's a window in a land where there's a window. Anyway. So we have that, and then uh, I also was going to show you guys. Um, I was at a client meeting, talking to the client, and they they were hiring us to do some video stuff. Super cool guys, great product. We'll talk about that later. But um, their marketing guy was like, "Hey, look, I found a way to do green screen really cheaply." And I was like, "Oh, really?" My ears perked up because we used to have to buy Ultimat green screen paint. It's super expensive. It's a pain in the butt to come in because it has to. I don't know if it's full of lead. I don't know what the deal is, but it has to travel a very specific way. And it's like this whole hazmat suits are involved. I mean, it's just like chaos and it's super expensive. Uh, he showed me a quick trick on a green and I actually thought, uh, you know, the key on it was pretty solid. Um, knowing that that's not their core competency. They have the ability to do that stuff, but it was a pretty good green and, and in the seeing what the set looked like and what they had to work with. It did pretty well. Now there's some spill issues, but that's for a lot of people that are dealing with green screen. They always have spill issue problems, but it's pretty cool. I'm going to show you guys some of that too and give you that um, brand name. So I wrote it down somewhere. I wrote it down. Uh, and if I can't find it, we'll go off approximate memory, which is approximately a okay. I really want to turn to Jeff and say, what's happening in the Chatsky, Jeff? And there's no Jeff Beard Fosse to deal with. All right. So what we got going on, Sean Robinson's here. What's up, Sean? How are you, sir? We are, uh, we're doing delightful. How is you, you're in the Northeast somewhere, I think, sometimes. Are you faring well in that weather? I don't know, a Nor'easter? Is that what you guys call it? We just call them hurricanes where I'm from. Roll Tide. I uh, hope you're doing well. There he is, Jeff Wor Worley is here. Um, why is there no relationship between prime numbers? Well, it actually goes back to the Da Vinci principle. That's not it. Fibonacci. Does that sound mathematical? You know who you can ask? You, sir, Mr. Mpeg, you are just welcome to ask old Goodwill Hunting. That guy knows all kinds of shittle about math. Because Jeff will tell you, Drew knows... No, no, no! ...about mathematics. I'm not the math guy. I'm the talker. Jeff, math people are quiet. They think, they calculate... Math. Talkers 
We're lying our way through college. That's how we make it. And it's called an English degree or film school. <laughs> Either way you want to put it. Uh, Juan Manuel Calisto asks, what's your background as a filmmaker? How did you start your career in company? Great question. Um, I'm going to get to him. Hey, also, if you guys will do me a favor, since I'm kind of flying solo, hit the at craft show. So when you type it in, if you'll type in at craft show, uh, to get my attention, it will help me out greatly. All right. So how did I start as a filmmaker? Um, I actually started out as a documentary filmmaker, uh, working in for this, the, the company that owns this building. They had another building, uh, previous. I started out doing docs. I was a director of photography for them. Um, we filmed doc stuff, you know, lots of different things. Then they kind of changed their core competency from being, you know, um, live action elements of documentary and focusing on um, particle physics, uh, which I have no business filming. And I frankly don't even know how. So um, we did a couple little things left with them, but my contract ended and they released me, which is cool. I moved to the Midwest and started working in the marketing department of a, um, they're not a gun company, they sell gun accessories. They're like an online retailer, like an Amazon, but for bullets. Um, I started working for them and just bring kind of my video and production knowledge. I had done, uh, prior to that, I had done a little bit of film work. I'd been a PA, I'd been a location manager several times on like some two to $3 million movies. So I had like plenty of set experience. It's just getting into the technical post world. Um, I learned most of that as the DP and then kind of rolled over. So uh, working for them, I left that job um, because there was a great agency up there I wanted to work with. So I went into advertising. I was the VP of production. Inside of that, we kind of took a more cinematic approach to advertising. So it was that kind of hybrid uh, docu style format that's so popular now plus narrative. And so we started building that out. I got really interested in branded uh, entertainment. So we had a company called, you can actually find this on YouTube. It's called the Virgin Mattress. It's not pornographic. We had a company that sold bed springs. I think I've told this before, but I'll repeat it. We had a company that was a client that sold bed springs and they didn't sell the mattress, just the spring and the mattress, but, but they wanted to roll something out to kind of talk about their bed spring. So we produced a, or I wrote a concept um, based on truth. My wife, when we got married, made me buy a new mattress hence the Virgin Mattress, and we rolled that out. From there, um, I still wanted to do film. My time with the agency ended. Um, agencies have a pretty high turnover rate, if anybody's ever dealt in that, except for our buddy Nick Waugh, he's a mastermind. But uh, agencies have a funky relationship scenario, so we, uh, I moved back here, and uh, somebody came along and said, hey, I've got a five-picture deal, uh, Alabama's got new tax incentives, and I would love for you to shoot one of the films for me. So I did, he hated directing, and then he just said, I want you to direct these three films and then you can have two of your own. So I directed three features. They were all various ranges, up, upwards of five million, some two million, some one million. It's all over the place. So I directed those five uh, features. Uh, one of them is on Netflix right now. It's called Convergence. Uh, it's still up there. You can watch that one. Uh, we also have free commentary on the craft show Frame 29 Vimeo. So you can sync the movie up and listen to commentary. It's pretty It's pretty cool. Uh, it's kind of fun to do. And I show you behind the scenes clips as it goes. And then there's, um, and then the other one just came out at the end of last year. It's called Nigel. No, it's called Sask Watch. S-A-S-Q Watch. And uh, that one's available wherever. I don't totally fully know um, that. From there, I left the film side of things because my real drive in life was always to help people. So I then rolled it into, I took all the equipment that we had accumulated, which was a lot. Uh, we have we bought all of our own gear for those films, paid them all off and did all that. Took all that film gear and opened a company called Craft Show alongside with Jeff. And we launched Craft Show last year, officially launched it last year for tax reasons. Launched it last year um, and we've done really well. We've been really blessed. Our approach is to approach everything equally. So even if the client only has $1,000, if we took on the job, we treat it like that, 100,000, knowing that we might not be able to spend that much on production value, but we treat it that way, and it's worked really well. Um, we're, you know, we're very happy and proud of the fact that we, not arrogantly proud, but proud of the fact that in our first year, we did something a lot of agencies can't do, which is we won Best of Show, Judge's Choice Award, and two other Golden Addy things, which is, you know, for our local market is pretty good. Uh, considering no one had heard of us yet. So there's that. Um, and then that's kind of how we run the business. If that if that kind of helps, um, that's kind of like the that, that's kind of like the summation of it. And I would tell you one if, if you're in the business or you're not in it yet or you're trying to get in, it, it's a roller coaster and ride it out. Like it, it it's ups and downs and there's you know, there was time last year this YouTube channel came about because of of 
me and Jeff having a lull of work and we were bored and I was like, we got to keep creating. And so we started a YouTube channel and that led to a great relationship with Panasonic and Heirloom, which changed our careers dramatically. Um, it really just, it didn't just help us by having Panasonic on our reel or, or in our workflow. It, it introduced us and pushed us, um, you know, as producers, that's what, what people are supposed to do. And Sean and, and Matt pushed us to push into HDR and really take these little bitty cameras, these GH5s, and really just put them into the, the craziest workflow possible. So I'm just saying, like, just focus on it, jump on it, ride the wave the best you can, D buy the, the least amount of gear humanly possible. You just need just whatever it is, like a GH5 or a, a Sony, or if that's what you're into or whatever, just buy the least amount possible until you have so much money you need to spend it and your accountant will tell you spend more money that's when you start buying a bunch of gear um that's kind of it uh howard asked how do you accidentally changing the shutter angle on the gh5 carefully i have no idea i have that problem all the time um you just got to be very 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 carefully which one of sean robinson's lens tattoos is cooler all of them that's from mpeg um so halt says need to do an internship from a bachelor degree Want to do it in commercial video industry? Any, any tips? Yeah, you know, one way, um, we had an intern. Um, I'm not talking about Dawson, by the way. He's an apprentice and he's family. Different story. One way is to um, is to turn around and get um, shoot like a couple of spec ideas and show it to them and say like, look, I really want to get into uh, commercial production. Um, your best bet, and if I were really wanting to go into the agency world again, I would actually do an advertising agency first. That's what I would do is I would try and intern it's miserable work, but I'd intern for an uh, ad agency because you're going to get a way bigger amount of information. It's kind of like being a PA on set. It's such great information. You learn so much, but you'll probably get beat down just a wee bit. Um, let's see. On a serious note, do the tornadoes? No, we we. Uh, it's actually gorgeous outside. I don't. Jeff drove through it. I I don't know. Um, if Jeff had to deal with it on his way up. No hail damage, though my roof still needs replacing. I haven't done it. Paul Wright, Craft Show, could you talk a little about your experience as you got started to get uh, started to get approached by bigger clients and pitching higher budget projects? Yeah, I mean, I touched on it a little bit, right, Paul? So I was there for it. That's kind of the honest truth of where we came from. Um, our approach has changed. Like, so I imagine there's a video out there last year when I talked about transparent billing. And, you know, we had this, this system of where we outlined every single piece. And Sean, um, please feel free from a client side. If you want to say this, it doesn't offend me. Um, it would actually be helpful if you want to say this, but like for heirloom, for example, when we presented the budget to them, it was itemized like a madman. I mean, I literally itemized every minute, every bit, knowing that we were going to go over on some, but that's not their worry. That's never your client's worry. That's, that's an internal thing, but I gave them this full transparent, um, breakdown. And sometimes corporate clients need that or bigger clients need that. But nowadays, what I found is that, that, creates a series of problems. We were in a special relationship with Sean and them. They were pretty much hands off. I mean, they just let us do. But some clients, they start looking at those hours and they, they're like, well, do you really need to shoot for 12 hours? Well, yeah, I mean, you're paying me for a day rate, like <laughs> six hours, 12 hours. I don't do half days. It's one day only. So what I started doing now, and it's been very effective this year, we are on a growth path, like seriously not bragging, but to, to encourage you, we're having a super crazy growth. And we're in a position where, you know, that's why we can only really do the live videos now is because we just don't have time. Like we're booked almost constantly. And a lot of that has to do with how I'm approaching the budgeting process. I just give them the number. I do an internal budget that tells me and Jeff where we're going to land financially in terms of hours or if we have outside commitment. But then I just give them a flat budget. The trick to it is I cold call anyone. I have no shame with it. But when you're talking to someone who hasn't approached you and you approach them, you need to go in thinking about what their needs actually are. And you have to put aside all the cool stuff we love, like tech goes out the window. It doesn't matter what camera. They're not going to care what camera it's on unless it's maybe an ad agency. But they're not really going to care. And even then, some agencies don't. You really need to focus on what's the story to get them the best results humanly possible. That's what you're after. And so that's what we focus on is we listen to what they need. We don't pitch crazy ideas in the pitch meeting. Every once in a while, you can throw out a fishing line and throw an idea that might spark your brain. And you can use those as metrics to see how they respond to something. So sometimes I give a high low in a meeting without giving them numbers like, let's do this really crazy stunt based one that's like a huge social piece. Or let's do this really simple lifestyle video, which lifestyle videos are really cheap. But let's do this lifestyle content and just see where they respond better. And then you kind of know where to gauge them and, and kind of build it when you build your pitch back out. 
I also try and put an expiration date. That's something me and Jeff just learned. Trust me, it was a nightmare. I tried to include an expiration date on it. Um, so the biggest part about pitching to hire is you just need to have the confidence. Don't walk in there like you can't do it. If it's something that's out of your wheelhouse, make sure you have somebody that can. Like I'm okay at motion graphics, Jeff's okay at motion graphics, but we have a guy, Mr. Pickles, uh, Mr. Pickles destroys motion graphics. Like he is a champion. And if, if Mr. Pickles is busy, I go to a guy that cost me a little bit more, but like he did ESPN's graphics. Like he's huge level stuff. Just know that you have those people that you can deal with uh, in that capacity to uh, do it. Sean Robinson, thank you so much. Sean, if you wanted to post about it, yeah. Uh, Sean says, one of the biggest reasons we were so comfortable working with Craft Show was because of the extreme level of professionalism they brought. Everything was clear and communication was great. That's my point. So it's all about communicating to your client, like tying them together and making sure they know and understand exactly what they're getting into. Um, I don't play any bluff games. I just I just give it to them straight up. Um, <laughs> you guys all think that, that I'm the comedic side of the outfit. Ask Jeff who... who I don't know. I don't know who all's friends with me on Facebook. I'm I'm the mouthy, rowdy uh, defender of of small businesses and clients guy. I'm the send me in coach. Send me in. Um, yeah. Jeff will be back next week. If you were uh, Captain Bob Adventures, I love that name. If you were doing it all over again, what if anything would you do differently? Clone Jeffrey. I would clone a Jeff. I would love to have two Jeffs. Um, if I did anything differently, yeah, I wouldn't let the film stuff affect me so much. Um, I, you know, candidly, I, I've talked about it some, but I don't know how, how much people know. Like the, the one thing, if I could tell myself is you, you have to love what you've done and you have to marry to it because people are going to come. If you've done a good job, people are going to come after you no matter what you do. And whether my movie's perfect or not, doesn't matter whether it was heirloom, whether it's convergence, which convergence is like a baby to me. Uh, Nigel and Oscar or Sasquatch or whatever it is, people are going to come after you and they're going to say heinous things because you did something they didn't do. I wasn't prepared for that. And so for me, I, I allowed a lot of darkness into my brain and I was suicidal. Even though I have a family, I really dealt with a lot of personal issues. I mean, it was very, it was very hard for me in certain periods of, of that time um, to process that because I just dumped everything I had into something and people were taking giant shits all shittles all over it. For the last time, no. It was bad. And you can talk to Jeff. I mean, it was, it was, it was terrible. So now I would kind of look at it as don't read the comments. Don't listen to that stuff. That's what baby seal troll force really is. It's a reminder to me. I mean, we all joke about it and I know it's not a big thing to other people, but for me, the BSTF is a reminder of like, that's what it is. It's a baby seal begging for a fish. It's someone begging for you to give them attention. So had I done that, I, I would have taken all the knowledge I gained in film, but not the pain and suffering that I allowed myself. The choice I made was to let that in, enter my life. I wouldn't allow that to enter my life. The other side of it, I probably would have pushed as hard as I'm pushing this year. I should have pushed that last year. Um, we got blessed. We had a good year. Don't get me wrong, but I should have pushed this hard from day one. Uh, if you are running a business and you are a small business owner, or it doesn't even matter small. If you're a business owner of any capacity, if your dream is to do this stuff and you really care about your clients, you got to push every single day to a point of mental exhaustion almost every day. I've had to back off a little bit because I was I was I was burning it pretty bad at the start of the year. Jeff will tell you, like I was just I was out of it. Um, so I pulled back a little bit. I got a hobby again because I like every bit of my attention went into the business and that's not healthy either for me, a guy like me. Um, as you guys know, I'm crazy as crap. Uh, Real Aaron Collins is here. What's up, Drew and Craft Show? What's up, Real Aaron Collins? Another Aaron Collins appeared on my Facebook feed. It is not you, sir. Just wanted to let you know there's a fake Aaron Collins. I will not no. stand for it. Yeah. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect film. Um, there you go. Sean was being complimentary again. Nothing was kept in the dark, both good and the challenging. They're also the best being genuinely excited about what we do. Yeah. Well, we love it. Yeah. I was shooting a vape shop this morning, having a blast, just vaping, just, you know, my little vapor thing, just vaping everywhere. It was like vape chaos. Um, but they can't advertise, so I'm trying to figure out a way of helping them get more reach, um, and they're good peeps. Uh, Craft Show, I want to talk. Uh, thank you for opening up. Yeah, anytime. Look, that's what it's for. Uh, anything I can do, uh, that's what we do. Um, 
at craft show when you are practicing your art are you mixing it with client work are you using or are you using client work to give you the dollars to do personal stuff artistic stuff that is a fantastic question trev um let me tell you uh, music videos uh which is what won us that award which means it was pure art uh and our demo reel which is just you know editing um that's when i not all the time, but that's the majority of the time me and Jeff practice art. That's when we do really crazy things or try things that, that you know, we tell the client first, hey, this may not work, but don't worry, we have a backup plan. We don't do a whole piece that way with someone else's money, um, but we do try some stuff. So we have one coming up. I'll share it with you. If you guys got any ideas or thoughts, I want to take two GH5s specifically because of small footprint matching lenses, and I want to stack them. So if this is lens size, I'll do it this way. So this is lens side, right? So I want to take two GH5s and stack one with the lens proper orientation pointing out, the other one upside down inverted on top like this, right? So you have two cameras sitting on top of each other, and then I'm going to set them on a U track. We have a we have 270 degrees of dolly track and a curve, you know, curve track. And so I want to take them and pan them so you have two different, you have an inverted and a top side one. I don't know what it's going to look like. I might flip it after the fact, but I want to take that and do uh um I figured it out it's like 15 passes in each location for the song and then mix them up so that you basically you try and find sync points best you can sometimes you let it go but you just mix it up so you might have some that are they're going backwards so if you imagine on a curved plane it's rotating this way and some that are rotating this way but it's a weird split screen effect that's totally done in camera so that that's an example of art right and that client loved it and he's all in um heirloom despite what people understand or realize in some cases was complete and total art uh, from a technical standpoint, as much as it was anything else, I, I bring that one up because that was the maybe, and I'm sorry Sean's in this to hear it, but that was maybe the biggest risk for a client we've ever taken. Um, luckily, I think the reward paid out, but instead of doing um, you know, a little more safe sort of approach, we decided to go big or go home. Um, to me, I'm a filmmaker. I make films. Uh, whether they're brand films, advertisements, or narratives, I, I come from a film background. I, I use old language because I still think that way. I'm a filmmaker. So to me, a camera is an extension of my story and is going to help me tell that story. So we wanted to tell a filmic type story and way push the production boundaries of everything. And so that's a case where we took the art. We got it approved by them because we sent them scripts, as Sean said. I mean, we sent them everything ahead of time. There was no surprises except for technical challenges. It was a new product, right? And that's how we did it from the art side. Um, a lot of times in commercial land, I'll push that if, if the client is willing to do it. Typically, the best clients to let you explore new artistic mediums are going to be agencies. However, there's a catch. Advertising agencies often hire you because you shoot a certain way. That's the other thing about the film business and advertising is, let's say, me and Jeff are really good at lifestyle, so we get a lot of lifestyle work. But if someone came along and said, hey, we really want you to do more of a noir kind of shadow play style, they'd probably be floored at, at, at that style because that's kind of what me and Jeff originally cut our teeth on. It's just not many people at the time were doing that sort of trend. So Jeff and I can make these really dark, like, you know, nice, beautiful, hard black images, um, hard shadow images, um, but we just don't do it as much. Yeah, okay. Um, I hope that helps. I like risk, Sean says, push things and create new expectations. Hey man, uh, frankly, this is not, again, not because you're here, I'd say this and I've said it before, This is that's what I feel like you, the company you work with, how about that? That's not shameless. The company you work with has done. I. I Look, I'm still reeling over time code. Every time I turn on a GH5S, I see the time code window still burning. And it makes me so dadgum happy to know that I have that. And whether I need it or not is different, but I have it. And it will become much more integral in the process. Um, the fact that you guys are, are, I mean, as far as anyone I've dealt with, and I've dealt with a lot of, Oracle is one of the companies I've worked with. You guys are the most open and transparent I've ever come across, um, which is also a fantastic thing. That's it. It's always about reasonable expectations. That's the biggest thing. You guys work with a lot of vendors. If you are trying to hide something from a client, they'll sniff it out. They will. They totally will because look, they're focused on way more of the detail than you are. You might think that you are, but they're focused on more because it's their money, it's their product, it's their vision of, of how it's going to be executed. Uh, they're going to be more zeroed in, so you have to be very conscious. Just be honest. Just be honest up front. 
Um, where was one? Oh, recently I, I had to talk to a client about, uh, about something I couldn't do and, and had to tell him straight up, like, I don't know if this is the right fit. Um, we've never had to fire a client, but I've talked to other agencies that have because they either outgrew them or the, the client's needs were not being, you know, a good agency will say your needs are not, we're not able to meet your needs anymore. Um, not from a jerk standpoint, but from a realistic standpoint, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, you say the Inferno is the best recorder out there. My test shots burned in on, on the on-screen info. There's no depth in-depth video how to use the damn thing on the GH Fire. Are you down? Yeah, I will totally, we'll show you how to do one. You basically just have to turn that stuff off. You don't get it. Uh, that's the, like, you don't get, not you, you get it. <laughs> you don't get to have the on-screen data uh, from your GH5 and the Shogun. So you almost have to treat it as two different, two different objects uh, when dealing with that. Um, it has to be a clean output. Um, it cuts across all business, super important. That is totally right. Uh, Trev said, uh, clearing uh, open communication channels cuts cuts across all businesses. And it's true, it's 100% true. All right, so let's take a look. While we take a break on this, if you guys have any more questions, just think them up, fire them over. Uh, Jeff can try and answer some, but again, we're open book today. Almost anything, I will go over numbers or whatever within reason. Um, just let me know what you want. I'm gonna show you guys this, um, Sorry, I have to look back now because there's no Jeff. I'm gonna look and, and show you guys this light leaks thing. Uh, so to set it up, uh, we were shooting, again, getting experimental with a the client. Uh, they actually asked this for a favor and they're, they're very close to us, it's a skate mountain. So we do a lot of work with their music videos and, and have fun. So one of the things I was doing is, you guys might've already seen this before, but I had forgotten it and hadn't done it in a while, is basically put a light source right under the lens and then you know you do your little objects in front of the lens to give you sort of effects. However, if that object radiates light, like a business card, for example, or styrofoam or a finger, you can actually get a kind of light look effect out of it that I think, um, not all the time, but just for in this case, like we had shot so much coverage, it was like, let's just play with it. Might be kind of interesting if you're doing something where you, the, the frame just wasn't super hot and sexy and you just needed to add some value. It's just a way to just to kind of think about it that you don't need a lot of things for. You literally can take a bounce underneath it and put your bounce underneath your lens and then hold your, I don't have the other camera, Jeff took it with him to Kentucky, but hold the camera up and I'll show you right now. So this is what we did. So as you can see, this will start to look, kind of look like, yeah, it starts to look like light leaks. Um, they're not perfect ones, but it's pretty close to a light leak. You're getting some of that sub banding, you're getting some of that, that breakout from it, uh, or it's coming in in bands rather. Um, and you can kind of see it on two different pieces. I, I, Jeff did not color correct this. I just kind of graded it real quick. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, graded it real quick just to show that, but you can kind of see that as I'm moving my fingers there, you kind of get that light leak effect. And this is just a sample of it, but the more I did it, uh, the more I was able to kind of generate more and more of these and add it. Now, why is that cool? Why is that important? Because frankly, like in this kind of stuff, if I were doing a music video for them and I could just do this light leaks and not have to drop it on, um, you know, or maybe just commit to it, it's just something I like to do. Um, you can also turn around and do it, you know, obviously in post, but it doesn't feel as real to me as, as something like that. And frankly, um, I tested doing light leaks off of uh, GH5 and I just didn't really like the... Um, I just didn't like the way it worked. Uh, yeah, Matt, I've done some of the lens whacking. Actually, the, the best place to do that, um, the best camera for that, <laughs> and it messes it up, but it's true, is uh, if, you, if you are shooting on an Epic or a Red with the box, um, hit the side. And so we had like a fight scene for some horror movie, Hayride 2, back Electric Boogaloo or something. And right as the impact happened, right, he throws, the big monster guy throws a Jeremy Sandy, who you guys have seen on the show, throws Jeremy Sandy into a wall. And as he does, I just I just popped the camera like this. And when I did, I used the, the rolling shutter effect to cause a jitter. And it gave me this really, really, really great moment of feeling the impact with the actor or the character, I should say. And so, yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll do it on that. I won't do it on the GH5. Uh, I haven't, I, I don't really do it on the GH5S just because I, I don't know how sensitive the sensor is in that space to do that little trick. Oh yeah, Hey Ride 2 is also on Netflix. Um, Jeff did some shots, I did some shots. Uh, Trev asks, uh, at Craft Show, are more clients coming to you educated in the past? On the photography side, 10 years ago, you had, uh, you, your educated clients. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Now they come to you already very knowledgeable about what, about their needs. I have to admit two, three years ago, I really hated flare. And now just call me flare boy. Yeah. I'm the same way. I like light leads and flares. I overused them 
two years ago. Um, pretty crazy. And uh, Sons of Liberty, I think that one's on Amazon Prime. Not the TV show, it was a movie. Um, and you'll see it in there. I went a little crazy with it. But uh, yeah, so clients, uh, on our side, the clients that come to us, they, we're in a kind of a nice spot right now. They come to us for style. They come to us for the look. Me and Jeff have carved out a certain way of telling a story. So they come to us with that. They don't really come to us for um, technical stuff. I've had very, in fact, I would say Panasonic plus one other client are the only two that have ever had technical demands set. And we understand why Panasonic did. The other one, um, they were just knowledgeable enough to know enough terms they probably watched the craft show channel <laughs> and they were just firing words back at us. Um, they had a little bit of technical knowledge um, and, they, and they had some demands in that way. But frankly, most of them leave us alone. I will tell you the biggest thing that I've learned, um, the biggest thing I've learned is that uh, clients, they don't ever really understand log. So if you have to show any piece of footage to a client that's not super technical, even fancy film dudes. Like we have a friend who's a fancy film dude and he's probably watched more dailies than any of us ever combined, but he still has a tough time with log. So I, I'm, this isn't for our LUTs. I don't give a crap whose LUT you use, but I would make sure I had some kind of LUT or the ability to create a LUT or create a little color grade to show them some of that because it makes a huge difference. Like you can if you're if you send them now you can be strategic let me back this up sometimes we'll send log because we don't have time but we also will send log because we we want to make sure that they feel that the final product looked better than the initial product and you just when they see it color corrected they're so used to seeing it washed out when they see it color corrected their brains explode and drip out of the ears especially like with the gh5s because the color saturation on that you get good stuff out of the gh5 but my god the s is just cuckoo i wish i had that farmer footage to show you guys on that um yeah uh the real aaron collins says is it true that gh5f is not an actual is not actually an upgrade to the gh5 but simply a different camera yes 100 percent. the gh5s look i come from the land of film stocks i come from the land of film stocks which is also down under do we have anybody from down under here um Yes, it's a completely different film stock. Think of it that way. So if you've not ever shot film stocks and you don't know what I'm talking about, consider the look of Fight Club and consider the look of Gone in 60 Seconds. Kind of similar, but two different film stocks, two different film stock processes on the back end. Those stocks make a difference in grain structure, color, and all that stuff. And that is exactly what the GH5S is. Um, I feel like the GH5S, if you're an old film guy, feels like Fuji to me. It feels like it's because it's got that color. It's got a little more color pop to it. It feels like Fuji. And the GH5 feels more like, to me, on a good lens, a GH5, same lens, let's say, the GH5 feels a little bit closer to like Vision, uh, the Kodak, the old Kodak Vision stock. Um, it's been a while since I've shot Kodak Vision, so they've, they've changed the formula, but that's what I would relate it to. Um, Jared Budlong, sorry to be getting here late. No one cares. You're just going to steal things. Just kidding, pal. Uh, <laughs> Jared, Jared Bear. Uh, MPEG says, have you used HLG on any paid content yet? Uh, you know, we tried to upsell it a few times. Um, wait, I think we did somewhere, Jeff. Didn't we do some HLG somewhere? I don't remember. Uh, Jeff will have to actually know. Um, we did it somewhere and I don't remember what it was, but you know, a lot of clients right now aren't a hundred percent in I think us having the knowledge and having the workflow is very, very, very important. I think that on a film standpoint, if you're putting out any product that way, but I think the bigger, the bigger win will be just like when HD finally locked in, it's going to be the exact same scenario here. When HDR finally locks in, they're going to scramble. Um, and I think you can get work on two ways. I think one, you can get work for original content. I think you can get more work, um, getting content from the post-production side where you might be converting. So I think something like, you know, we use that Atomo Sumo because uh, um, it helps us do an, a 2020 conversion correctly um, using scopes in an actual 2020 image or close to a 2020 image. So we use that to help us out on that. Um, sorry, Matt Bounfield, I'll go home now. Aww, don't go home, Jared. Ivan, uh, I'm gonna say it's Huaros. 
Uh, Drew, I'm coming from web development background. Every client is suddenly an expert on design. Of course they are. I learned WordPress this year and I've sold three WordPress websites, bro. <laughs> it's terrible. I know it's bad. It's templates, man. They're great and they're damn at the same time. And that goes to video too, because there's all these stock footage company or stock video companies out there just like selling stock video or they're like the ones where you just upload seven pictures and it just farts out a, uh, a video. No! It's terrible stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean your selling point is, uh, or let me see if that's what you want. How much do clients influence what you actually shoot when it comes to visuals, ideas, colors? Okay, yeah. There's a lot of it. Um, their product colors, their product brand, all comes into play. You got to keep in mind this isn't a film in the traditional sense of... Uh, in advertising, you're never really an auteur. Creative directors are auteurs, but if you are the... Uh, in agency language, creative directors, like the executive producer but in, in TV, but... You're never. You're always going to be a vendor. So most of the time, you don't get that auteur relationship. You don't get that full control. So you have to be very thoughtful of that. You also need to know your cameras, your lenses. You need to understand the technical of, and you, your client doesn't need to know this, but you need to. It, you need to know that, like the GH5S. If I have to shoot something that's super red, I need to be knowledgeable of that of how I'm going to light it because I need to lift that red up because sometimes the GH5. It, it responds really strong to red. It, it responds great to blue and green, but it responds strong to red. So I might shoot something on the GH5 instead or on the red itself, the red camera. So you have to be thoughtful of that kind of that kind of technical side. But normally they're going to have a brand guide or a style guide to give you parameters. If they don't, make sure you go over that with them ahead of time and be like, here's what I'm thinking, here's the colors, and give them that extra little push because the last thing you want to do is get into a bad situation where you've got to alter your post-production side of it. Uh, that's where it gets really nasty. It's more about the mindset of making sure you set expectations through clear communication with that client of what you're going to get and how you're going to maintain it. Sean Penner. Sorry, guys. I'm behind because I'm trying to answer everything. Hola, mi hermano. Hello, Sean. Guten tag. The gates. Um, Trev, Ivan Juarez. I was a software engineer. for. Uh, yep, there you go. Yeah, look. It's templates, man. I mean, that's that's what we face on a daily basis is that we're fighting against... Um, like I said, we give the, we give a thousand dollar client the same as we give a twenty five thousand dollar client, uh, same as a hundred thousand dollar client, depending on the production budget. Like right? so, the budget is dictating more people, more props, more events, more story. But as far as the quality of the look, we try and make it all the same, so you can't tell the difference. And most people can't. Most people have no idea. Um, did you leave his HR? Take it back to Rec Seven or Nine? I want to say we took it back to Seven or Nine. And I only think we did it because we were monkeying around. I'm not totally sure. I don't totally remember. It was only once because, again, the client didn't really want it on delivery side, MPEG, asking about HDR elements. David Flores, what are you expecting for the GH6 and do you know any info on it? I know nothing. No, I really don't know anything. Uh, GH6, um, I expect it to, I don't know. You know, I, I don't. I, I wish I did. I don't, I don't even know what I want anymore. Um, these have done such a great job for me. I guess, you know, part of me kind of wants full frame, but I'm not missing it now that I kind of understand how to shoot these cameras and, and how to process data for these cameras visually. Um, I've gotten a little bit used to it. Maybe maybe a better menu system. I feel like sometimes it's it's not quite a, a, a video professional menu system, but I understand why. It's a hybridized. I mean, that would be my only nitpick. Um, if the GH6 uh, has 6K HD, uh, 6K high res anamorphic with HDMI output, I'd be a tickled guy. I'd be very happy. So I could go back to that. Um, Jeff Worley, when do you want to shoot stuff and take out a camera almost as is? What's your favorite profile to use? I can answer that. Natural. Oh, he already did. Dang it. I'm behind. Any thoughts on the Sony A73? Yeah. Uh, Look, I don't know how it responds to low light. That's not like a, a critical function for me, though. My God, you can get lazy with a GH5S. It's delightful. But um, lazy meaning I just don't have to light as much. Uh, you suffer from it a little bit because you don't get that style, but still, I can get away with stuff. I don't like um, – I've never been a big fan of the way Sony footage looks. That's why we, we, we actually – pre-purchasing a GH5, which was not given to us by Panasonic by any way, shape, or form, we we tested it. I had shot on a Sony A7S7, whatever the, the other Sony A7S, and didn't love it. Hated it on a project. I had shot on C100s. We almost bought a C100, and at the last minute, our buddy Kyle from U, uh, Unink Studios bought one, bought a GH5, 
and uh, we shot on it and we fell in love. And that's like some of the very first content we ever produced. That's just like us truly rawly falling in love. If anyone doubts the fact that we really love that camera, that's where it came from. Um, yeah. Uh, we didn't, I don't, I don't remember what it was. We did go back to 709. That's right. Wow. There's a GH6 now in the works. I'm sure there's there are probably three prototypes up, maybe two, probably two prototypes up. I mean, they're, they're they got to pay these people. They got people on payroll. Like, so the people that designed the GH5, what are you going to do once the GH5 comes out? You're going to design the GH6. That's what I would imagine. If I was running a business, that's what I would say. GH6 dual ISO without multi-aspect ratio and IB. Yeah, that would be pretty sick. Yeah. And this is great because Panasonic is taking notes. <laughs> they don't listen to me. They don't want to know what I want. I want to, I want to, I want to, <laughs> I want it built in with city tape. Can we make that happen? Can I have built in city tape? And, uh, uh, oh, and all the lenses have internal follow focus. Hmm? That's what we want. That's the GH6 magic. Um, uh, Aaron, you know what? If I were you, depending on, I don't remember what you shoot. You told me once. I would, f if I were you and I was looking at one of these, I would probably, I would, I would test them both, but I, I would maybe consider evaluating the GH5S. Um, I, I wouldn't say I, it's my favorite of the two children, but I love that kid. It's a pretty good kid. That, that would be my thought. Um, finally, dude. <laughs> can you guys please april fools that seriously please roll that out make it like <laughs> do you remember the, the the oh my gosh i had one the, the vhs no it's a used audio tapes the the v v vhx 2000 P pixel 2000 vxl 2000 do you remember that and it recorded video onto onto audio cassettes that that sir that would make the greatest April Fool's Day of all time. I think it should happen with with a beta deck like, and it comes like the old way of VHS, which you guys, you kids, probably don't know. Although I think this channel's a little bit older. You know, you used to have to carry the camera and you carry the bag with you. If you put that out called a GH6, I would be so happy. That would be amazing. Um, I want raw. I want a camera with mini SDI out and raw out. That's my biggest dream. You can get one. It's called a Red. Just saying, or an Alexa. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Trev. One of my first video cameras. You've used a... Uh, yeah, those are amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, before your time, David, I understand. That's how it works. Let me show you guys this green screen thing. If you have any other questions, just think about them. Let me pop on over to this. All right, so... This is pretty cool. So this guy gave me a can of paint when he was done with it because they didn't need it anymore. They got what I would consider to be a decent key. Again, look at the key. Don't look at the spill. I mean, the spill is the spill. They didn't have a lot of grip gack to kind of control the green. So I'm going to show you guys the footage and then we can t kind of talk about it through. But like, you know, that's not terrible. It's not perfect, but it's not terrible green screen element. That is That, that screen behind them was green and they turned to that shade of uh, whatever their company color blue is. They changed it to that. Uh, it's just playing in a loop, but aside from the spill, it's really not a bad key. Uh, and that was shot on a, because you're going to ask, that was shot on a Canon 80D. Does that sound like it makes sense? I don't know cameras. Uh, it was shot on an 80D or something. ADD. It was shot on ADD. Um, but that color paint at having seen the room itself, that color paint uh, is from the Disney collection that you can get at Home Depot and it's called like Buzz Lightyear Gamma Green, I think. I can't, re I tried to look for the note earlier, I can't find it. It's called Gamma Green and it's from the Disney collection. So what's crazy is uh, the guy tweaked the color slightly so you can take in a, just a basic piece of green that you want. The guy did it and tweaked it. Now, why is that a big deal? Because Ultimate Paint is, it used to be 350, 250 or $350 per gallon. And we had a whole green screen wall of it. That was a nightmare. Now granted it has some luminosity value that's really great, but that level of green is what, 40 bucks, 50 bucks a, a gallon. And so, you know, now you have enough to, to paint a, uh, an object and it's latex based. So when it dries, you get a, a very, what I saw was a very nice flat image, but it also dried enough that um, I feel confident with one, one coat in a pinch. So if you had to green screen something quickly, a pretty cool piece of kit and frankly, dirt cheap. And the key, like I said, it still has to do with lighting, but the key looked fantastic. Not necessarily the spill, but the key looked fantastic in that uh, capacity. So just something to think about. I thought it was kind of cool that on the DIY element, if you're in a pinch, 
that's a pretty effective way of doing it, and that's a result. And like I said, I walked up. This is a corporate place. They had no lights. They had, you know, they had some small like uh, Amazon special uh, LED lights, and uh, that's how they lit and did their whole thing. So it's good enough to work. So there you go. Um, yeah. Any other questions going on? I don't really have a ton to talk about. Obviously, uh, it gets a little uncomfortable in here. Like with Jeff gone, it's a little uncomfortable. I just looked over. Jeff probably knows where I'm looking. I looked exactly over at uh, old Dawson Pants' desk. And so, you know, it's kind of weird sometimes in here and uh, when no one else is in here because Dawson shows up and, and he starts playing death metal. It's really bizarre. Um, they're actually, uh, they did a real cool thing for that guy. You know, he was in a film school program called Film Connect, Film Connection or something. That's how we met him. And they did a real nice tribute uh, to Dawson, which I thought was pretty nice of them to do because he essentially was paying them and they still turned around and, and did it. Uh, and gave him a nice tribute, which was always awesome. So there's that. Um, I'm trying to think of the other breakdowns of what we have. We don't really have a ton of content I can show at the moment. We got a lot of clients in the works, but none of it's been greenlit to, to, do, uh, to do anything. Um, so is that you? MPEG says, Drew, you did a good job with the show today. So are you saying, MPEG, you're done with me? Would you like for me to hit the button, kill the show, say goodbye? No. What's that? N-O. Um, yeah, without Jeff here, I just don't have anybody to, to witty banter with. So we may just keep it short and simple. Um, any other questions you guys might have, feel free to always shoot us an email. Um, if you have thoughts or you want to get specific on a project, we'll talk as much as we can. It's better in this form for us just because of time. But if there's anything you guys need or want or want to see, uh, someone's asking for an Inferno video, we will try and do that. I'll do the best I can on it. It's pretty simple. I'm actually using, anybody using the Inferno or the Shogun or is curious about it, I'm actually using it right now. So I'm looping it all through. I turn on the LUT inside of the Shogun that kicks it back over to the computer through all that stuff. Um, and there we go. I know you mentioned how sharp your GH5. Nah, I think the GH5S is inherently a little bit sharper. Um, yeah. Matt, you can come always be awkward on camera. We'd love to have you in here. We love Matt Banfield. So Paul Wright asked if I mentioned how sharp the GH5. Part of it is the Sigma. Part of it was even with the vintage lens, which is like super creamy. Um, it just, it's not a bad thing. I'm not upset by it. Actually, weirdly, my stance on that is changing. I, I interestingly enough, have been fooled now several times by Jeff where um, I knew it was red versus GH5, but I didn't know which camera it was. And Jeff did a fantastic job of really just softening the image uh, using some tricks in, in um, DaVinci. So yeah, you know, I'm okay with it. I, I, I think now the only, the only thing we're adding, and we talked about last week, is adding some uh, Black Pro Mist to our arsenal. The downside of that is, again, thinking about it, sometimes clients don't really want super cinematic. I know how to get it there, so do you. I'm sure everybody here does, but sometimes they just don't want that full sort of roll, uh, that, that sort of roll off that, that cinema gives, or the <clears throat> full, full frame sensor look. So instead, I shoot it sharp, and then we just deal with it in post a little bit. Um, if I were doing more narrative stuff, in fact, we have a project, again, can't talk about it, but we have a project where it does need to be very close to film. So, uh, in fact, we have to shoot 20, true 24. We can't shoot 23, 976. So if it all goes through, we have to shoot very close to film to match film. So that's going to be kind of tough. Um, but it's exciting, and we're looking forward to it. You guys will figure it out. If we do it, we're going to try and do some content from down there. In fact, we probably wouldn't be able to live stream from down there, so we'll have to figure that out. But we're getting promise for that so we can soften the image slightly. Um, and we have to deal with a lot of technical stuff. Yeah. It's just it's just a little bit sharper. Um, any client that doesn't like ProMist, you should fire. Totally joking. Yeah, well, buddy, I had one. It was I was using ProMist a long time ago as a uh, softener on a woman's skin. And she said, this makes my skin look too soft. At which point I said, yes, ma'am. And I pulled it out. And it was... You know, that's her problem, not mine. I tried. Um, poor makeup girl, just got beat down. So, whatever reason, everybody has their opinion, and and your job is to to say yes or yes, ma'am. Push back when you need to, and, and do it. How do you feel your clients feel when you roll with your GH5 versus your Red? 
Or do you always carry red? No, I roll up all the time. In fact, I haven't broken out the red for a client in a long time. And the reason why is because I just don't feel the need to. Um, they don't know the difference. They really don't. They, the greatest thing in the world, if they do have a technology question, is turning around to them and saying this exact thing. Oh, well, this camera matches that. And if you don't believe me, here's my YouTube channel. Like that worked for us. Uh, agency clients have not cared. I've had one agency guy ask me specifically to bring the red. And then when I quoted the project, um, it's not that we quote that much more for the red, but when I quoted the project, I said, here's what the red costs, but here's what another camera costs. It gets the exact same look. And he was like, oh, go with a cheaper one. And I did it on purpose. I just didn't want to bring the red. The red requires a whole lot more packing. Like currently, hold on. We've talked about it before, but currently we get majority of our uh, entire camera kit necessary into this Peli pack. So like I had it on the shoot today, so I carried the GH5 because it was built. And so, you know, inside we have all our, oh, you guys can't see that. Oh, I look like I'm giving birth. Um, inside we have, good God, man. Inside we have all this crap, right? Like ND filters all this stuff it's all full of stuff and then it's got front pockets on the lid that where you keep our cards and we kind of have an organizational process this isn't a pitch for that this is just the difference and wherever it is and then on the upper deck i don't put the camera in but i have like batteries because we operate the gh5s off of anton's um ssd cards for the shogun a little light extra lenses uh two extra lenses as a matter of fact piece of duvetine and some uh, polarizer filters, like for our 4x4 matte box. Plus, I'm able to carry my mic stuff. Often I'll have... Ha! Fixed. I'm back. I don't know. It's probably too late now. <laughs> I let it sit on black for too long. I don't really... I think it was streaming black. I think that's epic. What a what an epic uh, thing. Yeah, so what died was an Anton Bauer battery. Um, it was, I was powering quite literally multiple devices. Oh, I didn't have my phone on anymore. Um, I think I just pushed it. I used the same battery I was using, so that's what happened. I don't know if uh, if, I've, if I miss questions or not. I'll try and close those out. I got about five, six more minutes. Is there anything I miss? Um, 
I made him get up. Oh yeah. So what I was saying was, and someone, I see your other question about film school. Um, what I was saying was I use that backpack and, uh, and carry most of my gear versus what me and Jeff normally do, which is a huge bag that we have to carry for the red. Like it's a, we can put some red pieces in there, but it's still not enough. Like we have to carry this big, uh, production bag and it's a pain. So we kind of, uh, don't do that. Feel brighter. Does it feel brighter? I don't know. I'm just asking. Um, I don't know if I broke something. Let's see. It feels brighter to me, like a little bit brighter. I can't tell. Um, all right. Did I go to film school? Yes and no. I went to a school that had a film school, um, but it was mostly focused on television and I just made it film school. Uh, we found out they had film cameras um, in the archive department, so we would sneak in and borrow them for the weekend and we would shoot Bolex uh, H16 and then we had an REBL... I don't even remember what model now. It was an REBL whatever. And we would take that out and do that stuff. Um, and we kind of just ran with it. Uh, so Halt, Craft Show, me again with internship questions. What do you think is the minimum skill level required to get a good internship position? None. That's the point of an internship. You should be able to walk up in there and just be like, hey, I'm, I'm just eager to learn. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. Um, you know, within legal reason, don't get taken advantage of by any way, shape or form, even financially. But I would, uh, I would do that. I would jump right in. Sean Pinner, South in your mouth. Um, I would do that. I would just go for it um, and just walk in and be like, hey, I'd love a chance. And I'd tell them what you're doing. Most of the time, you know, what's funny is like f I would find a boutique agency above and beyond a big agency. Now, a big agency will look better on your resume if that's what you're after. But a boutique agency is probably going to give you a little more hands-on experience. Um, in the relationship, for example, with David, uh, or sorry, Dawson, Dawson came to us as an apprentice and initially um, just wanted to learn a little bit about film and he was only supposed to be here a few hours a week and then all of a sudden like we just started leaning on Dawson and we just made him part of the family and then he literally helped co-write Heirloom and he put in the effort on that to make that help, help you know the creative side of that so we put if you build the trust you get something uh, much better out of it and um, and connect over together. Justin Gale, are you seeing the jitters problem with the GH5S? No, and I, not as much. And I think part of the reason why is I shoot the GH5S completely different than a GH5. Um, if I do shoot the GH5 handheld, it's usually on a shoulder rig like this one. So, oh, hey. So it's up like this. And so on my pan side, I'm a little more controlled because it's a tight scenario. Um, and then the Shogun goes right here, by the way, um, or the Inferno, whichever way. But I, I'm usually shooting off a, off a much steadier rig, and our build puts enough weight onto the camera that the center of it feels pretty strong on my shoulder to do that stuff. So, no, because I shoot handheld differently with the GH5. Um, GH5S, I haven't noticed it as much. I had to force it to show up anyway um, back when we did our tests. And what I mean is, is I don't normally pan that way, and I, the kind of the process in which I was doing it was not necessarily the same way we do stuff so i uh i uh you know i i don't know I, I i haven't noticed as much i'm sure there's some little portion of it there um and we could go back and do another test on it but i think if you're seeing it constantly i would consider now let me back oh, let me say this if you're seeing it constantly i would consider shooting a different way and trying to figure out where in your shooting style it's affected um uh, you know, I'm a recreational uh, a gun shooter. I have um, license to carry guns and I go train on those guns. And one of the things about that was I noticed that I'm holding a, a, a pistol in my hand and as I am pointing at my target downrange at the shooting range, which is safely and not pointed at any human beings, YouTube, I, I would... Uh, I would point down range and you know I, I would shoot and I would notice a, a flinch left or right and so I had to change my grip slightly and when I did that it increased it's the same way when you're filming is that I used to film uh, a little bit I would have the shoulder pad a little bit further uh, back as far as I wanted I've now moved it well this is the short one but I've now moved it um, a little bit closer to the center of my head for the GH5 Whereas the red, I scoot all the way back as much as I possibly can. And I often take my these now 
and I pull them forward, as long as they don't get inside of the way, I will, I will sometimes shoot like this if I know I'm doing a lot of turning or I'll invert them in. It just depends on what the shot is. You have to just kind of think of it like that. That's part of your job as an operator. That's not, I would never do that. That's way uncumbersome. But think of you, you're operating in the capacity of that's an art. That's why it's a, a union specialty is being an operator is very specific. Um, Trailblazer Studios in Northern, okay, as intern. Here he goes. Shameless. Uh, actually, I would, if somebody had a chance to go to Trailblazer, I would take it in a heartbeat. I think it's a great technical internship plus creative and narrative internship and all the, the awesome stuff they're doing is great. That's where Sean is. So if you question Trailblazer Studios or you have great color questions, Sean Pinner, his email is, I'm just kidding, buddy. Um, oh, Clark, you're so late. It's three o'clock. I'm about done. Do you just not remember? Are you, are you on... Are you on East Coast, West Coast time, Clark? You're in mountain time. Clark's in mountain time. Uh, Real Aaron Collins, I have heard you actually operate the GH5S like a film camera. I would say I would operate it like a RED or an Alexa. That's how I would treat it, and you get a wonderful result out of it. Um, yeah, it's – it's no, no sorry for the plug, Sean. It's totally good. That's great. There's somebody in here that's looking for something. Um, yeah, the GH5S, I would treat it like a film camera, and it works way better that way. Victor, you have an excuse, sir. You're not in the United States at the moment, unless you are, in which you have no excuse. Clark, now Clark has an excuse. He could say, I'm out saving the world. Um, I know I still want to do the shoot. In fact, I found out those armored trucks might be back in the picture, which, uh, if we do it, could be pretty cool because the last thing that Dawson officially wrote for us was the armored truck not the not counting Batman was the armored truck spec script and it's pretty good in fact Dawson also finished a screenplay that's absolutely fantastic a little jealous um, but I'm gonna try and figure that out uh, Pinner are you in rally he can just fly around the world and rewind time that's it were you really watching Ultimate Deletion? It was bad, man. I didn't like it. I, I, I liked it the first time we saw it when it was real, and I don't feel like it's real. It feels too forced now. Delete! Delete! I can't even do it. I almost did the wrong thing. You notice my hand. I took it out of the way. That could have been terrible. Um, he's got to consider that. That's kind, of a, that's kind of a racial gesture, if you're not careful there. We'll have to watch a recorded stream later. Sure thing, Techno. If you have a question, uh, Techno Pilot, feel free. You can... <laughs> If you, sorry, Clark, I'm laughing at you. Techno, if you want to send uh, an email, if you have any questions, I will extend the AMA, uh, AMAA, -A -A, ask us almost anything. That's patent pending. No! Yeah, if you want to do it, just send it over. All right, I'm going to really kill the stream this time, Ray. Um, it's it's time, and frankly, I have to go do this really boring edit job. I'm excited about it. I mean, I am just so excited about this edit job. It is Jeff, news has got to prove, by the way. We're greenlit. Good job. <laughs> Just going to tell you here instead of calling you. Uh, other business, Jeff, that we have to deal with. Um, got all the components for Parlor today, but didn't finish it out. This is actual business conversation. Did, I, I got all the components for the first week. I did not do week th uh, two through four. And, uh, oh, and... Um, uh, amusement client approved the wacky zany Alvin's Island spot or the concept behind it I don't know how to grade it because we forgot to give you footage and uh, that's about it I'm just giving you a heads up there you go Sarah Hall are you sure are you sure about what what did I say I Drew <laughs> Drew is one of the woke I am woken bro I'm 100% bro woken my wife now talking trash uh, all right, that's it. I'm done. Peter Kent, always a delight. Everyone else, Peter, I'm only picking on you because you're late. Techno, offer extended, whatever you need. Delete, delete, delete. I am <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. I can't even do his laugh. I can't even do it. I'm out. Thank you guys so much. I'll keep the chat ski open. This time I'm really 86 in it. Sarah, get in the kitchen. Take